Good evening, Brendan. How are you? Oh, not this again. Um, have, we, uh, <clears throat> have we lost you a little bit there, Brendan? Yep, it looks like maybe we have. Well, um, good evening to everyone uh, who's watching, everybody who's out there. We've got a, maybe a little technical problem at the moment. Uh, but today we're going to be talking uh, about Lint uh, in Colombia, which is something a little bit strange <laughs> to me, maybe. But uh, I quite... Oh, he's gone completely. Um, but I do like the idea of uh, giving something up for um, for 40 days uh, on, a, on a basic moral principle. That's a, a lovely thing to think of. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that uh, in today's uh, episode, uh, the idea of giving something up uh, over the Lent period, just like uh, Jesus out in the... Uh, desert for 40 days, drinking only water. Uh, I've been vegetarian for a while, so I think I'm going to continue uh, with that. And hopefully we're going to to get Brendan back uh, a little bit later. Um, does look like he's disappeared. Um so we're going to talk about time well lent yes regardless of whether you're a practicing uh, catholic or any other type of christian in the traditionally catholic country that colombia is the 40 days of lent that we are now in do offer a time for reflection so are you giving up a practice that you consider a vice or at least something you should drink or eat or do less often or hypothetically what would you quit here in Colombia that might make your life better. Some of us could do with reducing our consumption of pan de chicharron, uh, for example. Others of us might give up alcohol or wine or fancy cheese. But Lent is also a time to focus on acts of human kindness, virtuous undertakings. There are plenty of charities and foundations in need of support all year round but especially in this time of uh, of sacrifice uh, and richard stoller there uh, writing in to point out brendan's giving up entirely for, for lent i'm hoping richard it, it's not given up entirely and it's just uh, an internet problem um very much hoping he hasn't decided to uh, to take himself off this planet that would seem a bit extreme and in fact i think richard here oh no he was coming back. He is back. There he is. It appears, Richard Stoller, that your predictions of Brendan's demise are somewhat uh, uh, premature. Oliver, yeah, Oliver, I just got the tail end of that. How's it going? It's uh, it's 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 fine. Yeah, um, had a little. <laughs> I've been I've been reading through your presentation, uh, Brendan. Your carefully written presentation. All right, okay, well, you know, you have to highlight certain words because it's kind of coded uh, language that I use there. Um, or the, way I, the, way I, the way I write for broadcast is different to how I write for blogs uh, and for articles. But, yeah, I think we're having an, a, an emerging market uh, world problem here with uh, my Internet connection, or maybe it's just that the rest of my housemates have decided to uh, use... Um, <laughs> the internet at the exact same time and are downloading the latest netflix uh series or whatever i don't know but the internet is not as steady as it has been here before where did you get to though ali um have you got got to the, to the given third, everybody what's coming up on the show the third paragraph brendan oh well, okay well well we, we know That's what okay. we are talking about Fourth, you can. Uh, no, sorry, hang on. Uh, you can start on the right to us right now using the live comment facility. Well, there you go. <laughs> but of course, as I always say as well, Ali, if you're watching this pre-recorded, you can uh, still get involved <laughs> by commenting on where you're watching or via tweet, with the handle being, as you well know, Ali at Bogota Post, and do use the hashtag 
Bogger tonight. But before we get talking about Lent and all that and virtuous acts that people are going to do, and do send us in your thoughts, it's our take on the news you need to know from the past week. Now, on last Thursday's show, we spoke about how tonight we'd be previewing the arrival of the COVID vaccine to Colombia, which was due on Saturday, as in the 20th. Well, what do you know? They've only started inoculations ahead of schedule. Ali, a great public relations stunt by President Duque, or am I being a little cynical for once? Um, I think it's a little bit from box A and a little bit from box B, Brendan. Um, we're looking at a situation here where, um, look, I don't think any of us like the media circus that goes around with this. I don't think any of us uh, are happy with the grandstanding and, and all the kind of ministers forcing delays so they can be photographed next to people being jabbed and all this sort of thing. Yeah, look, it's distasteful. We all know that. On the other hand, they've started uh, a couple of days ahead of schedule. Okay, it's not spectacular, but 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 it's not late. I mean, you know, they have started ahead of schedule. Um, and, you know, as one of our contributors at the Bogota Post said the other day, any number above zero before the official start date, it's, it's a win. It's a positive. Um, so I think, you know, on balance, it's a good thing, Brendan. Yeah, I'm sure Duque might have played the, the old one that, that a lot of us used to this country do now. Things, there can be delays. And, of course, when you're relying on international travel and all that, maybe they knew they'd get the vaccines before the 20th. But Duque probably said, in contrast to your own prime minister in the UK, who's um, given dates that certain things will happen, and then he's had to backtrack uh, rather embarrassingly. But Duque said, OK, look, we'll probably get them in the week before the 20th, but let's say the 20th, and then if anything goes wrong, we should still have them by the very latest, by the 20th. So in a sense, it was kind of win-win and a smart tactic, if that is the case. Now, one thing I read on Blue Radio this evening, which kind of... It, it stood out for me is that they said these 50,000 vaccines will be administered to those who need them before the 23rd of March. Now, I know there are a lot of logistical problems here, but that, to me, I was kind of going before the 23rd of March. I would have thought before next week. But, you know, <laughs> who am I? I'm no expert in this. Well, it depends exactly. I mean, Remember that he's he's uh, talking about quite a large population and quite spread out. I'd imagine a large number of the initial vaccines will go out to the um, to the most needy. You know, they'll, they'll probably have a large percentage. I don't want to put a number on it, but I'd imagine there'll be a large percentage, certainly in the major cities. Um, you know, in the next couple of weeks, um, but then. Yeah, it's going to take a long time, Brendan, if we're talking about small, isolated, rural communities. Yeah, for sure. What did you make of of the first vaccine going to a nurse in Cincinnati? It seemed a bit random, but we were kind of discussing this before privately. You know, that maybe, well, we kind of joked that it might be some politician, but you had said, no, it'll go to, you know, some, some of frontline worker, yeah, whatever, and that's exactly, or, or, or some... Uh, elderly person, so it went to a to a nurse, which I guess seemed appropriate. Um, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll I'll pop a caveat on that, Brendan. The actual first vaccine may very well have gone to a politician, um, but certainly the first sort of official one and recorded one. And you know, let's let's be aware that there might be a scandal down the road, and it turns out somebody jumped the queue. Uh, certainly, it makes sense for the official first one. Yeah, she's a nurse. She's called Victoria. It's a win, isn't it, for everybody? Yeah, what did you make of the media coverage? Um, I happened to be watching RSAN when uh, the the vaccines were on their way and this kind of minute-by-minute minute account of where the plane, the DHL plane was, it was landing. I, I don't know. Um, I thought it was a little bit over the top. I'm not sure... Did Ireland have the exact same coverage when, when the vaccines were arriving there? Um, uh, is it something that we, <laughs> that we should be all going, woohoo, this is the greatest moment of the year, full stop? Uh, it seemed a little bit over the top. Um, I just, I have no idea 
um, Brendan. I, I mean, I, I think there's a sort of, there's a bit of a lull in terms of sort of news in Colombia at the moment. So, you know, it, 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 it's much more dominant, you know, of course, in Ireland, there's things like Brexit going on, um, you know, to distract people. Um, and no, no, per no Percy pigs in um, M&S stores. It's a disaster. No Percy pigs. That's lost on me. Is it a Brexit related thing? Yeah, apparently they, they couldn't export to Dublin so easily. So now certain sweets can't be got in M&S stores and it's a Brexit disaster. But anyway, there you go. Okay, okay. Um, I have to say though as well, mem of the of the year perhaps so far was um, when the vaccines were coming off the plane, and obviously there was that was a, a photo opportunity. But somebody had la, la vacuna in Colombia, and in place of the actual vaccines on on the the lift that was taking down the vaccines, you had um, like a triangle, a pyramid of police officers. Which uh, if if people know their Spanish, la vacuna. In these parts, uh, has a, a double meaning. But Ali, um, I sent you something there earlier on. That CNN have these projections of where Colombia is going to get all their vaccines, and apparently going to get ten million from Pfizer. And of course, these fifty thousand were from Pfizer. Uh, we're getting another fifty thousand uh, next week. I think next Tuesday or Wednesday as well from from the same source. But um, apparently. Bolivia and Peru have done deals, uh, can I say this, deals with the devil that we don't know about. Uh, and in contrast to Colombia, which seems to be all above board. Do you have a little bit more information on this? Because Colombia is obviously, and, and expats and locals alike here, or foreigners and locals alike, are, you know, we're, we're quick to have a go at the government and say, oh, so they're dragging their heels and it's a disaster, blah, blah, blah. But uh, Bolivia and Peru uh, weren't perhaps... More criticism. Well, okay, so let's look at the, you know, we've talked before about the the nonsense of comparing, let's say, Colombia to the UK or to, to Israel. Um, but let's think now about uh, comparing Colombia to countries who are maybe a little bit closer to Colombia um, in, in terms of background. Now, Chile's ahead, Argentina's ahead, Uruguay's ahead, Costa Rica's ahead, Panama's ahead. Okay, all of these are... Uh, richer countries, uh, better organized countries, more developed countries uh, than Colombia. So you'd expect them all to be ahead. That's nothing crazy. That's nothing unusual. Peru and Bolivia are also ahead of Colombia, sort of. It's a bit complicated, but they do appear to be moving a little bit faster. Yet they're poorer than Colombia. So this this creates a bit of a problem. I mean, that's where Maduro, oh, sorry, that's where um, Duque does look bad. Um, but let's hold on a second. One of the things that Duque is quite rightly criticised for is corruption. I know he likes to stand against corruption, but I think the reality of it is that, you know, people see him as a person who, um, while I'm going to be very careful about what I say legally here, uh, while not being involved in personal corruption scandals himself, is enabling it with people around him. Anyway, um, but if you criticize Duque for corruption, and if you look at things like the Ruta del Sol, if you look at things like the um, Odebrecht scandals, etc., and you rightly say, look, we're going to criticize him here, he hasn't done as much as he could have done, it seems a little bit harsh to then also criticize him for acting above board when it comes to... Um, uh, when it comes to getting vaccines. We don't know what Bolivia and Peru have paid. We literally don't know. Sinopharm, the Chinese agency uh, distributing vaccines, has a completely dead contract, a silent contract. You know, there are no, there's no information at all on the price. Uh, there's no information on any connections to it. And of course, there's no information at all on any shady business that might be going on on the side. There's also an element, um, I think, of, that's an annoying comment. Um, there's also um, an element, I think, of, um, there's, there's also an element here of, um, 
uh, of, a, of a bit of a PR war that both Russia and China are really coming home as G7 countries as and the rich world in general. As we've been talking about on this show for quite a while, they've been hoarding up vaccines, they've been protecting their own stocks, etc. China and Russia are doing the opposite. They're going out of their way to give extra doses um, uh, to other countries, especially in Africa, but also in Latin America. Does Colombia want to go along with the Chinese power shift? Does it want to stay loyal to the United States? There's a lot of play here, uh, Brendan. And, and of course, if anybody is willing to say, actually, I'd rather we did a corrupt, possibly corrupt deal with the Chinese and got the vaccines earlier. That's a relatively reasonable thing to say. Just knock off criticizing Duque for corruption in other spheres. You can't say you want him to be corrupt in this, but you don't want him to be corrupt in other things. That's, that's not how it works. Well, who's building the, um, the metro anyway? It's not a, a Chinese consortium behind that. So they're already here. Um, one Belt, One Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative, how do it's arrived in these parts. But um, uh, I think you are a resident, uh, well, I, I'm now <laughs> anointing you a resident vaccine expert, so you can tackle uh, Emma Newbery's question there um, that she just sent in. Well, just, for, for those of you who aren't, um, for those of you who maybe aren't aware, uh, Emma Newbury is the editor of the Bogota Post, the, the founder, uh, owner and editor, and she's just given me um, a particularly tricky question here. Um, and the answer is I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I know I know that COVAX uh, account for, and I'm just uh, waiting here, uh, COVAX is a about two-fifths of Colombia's total order. It's about 40% of um, the allegedly secured vaccines that Colombia has. Of course, these are secured on paper, and being secured on paper is very different to actually being in our hands. Um, so, yeah, how many have come in from the club? I, I suspect that COVAX hasn't delivered any yet. I think I'm I'm a layman when it comes to very much a layman when it comes to the names of all these vaccines and and where they come from etc. Oh no no Co 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 Covax is the international kind of cooperation to deliver uh, vaccines uh, globally. Ah okay okay well now that 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 makes it uh, clearer. Um one thing I will say though Ireland's man at the much criticized World Health Organization, or Organization Mundial de Salud, um, he said today, quoted in the Irish Times, that it would be a disgrace if Ireland vaccinates um, its younger people before elderly folk in emerging market developing countries have received their vaccines. Now, yes, the problem so I, would is, fully, I would fully agree with him. It's political yeah, suicide yeah. in the home country. This is where COVAX may come into play because uh, when the UK, well, with the UK ahead ahead of most countries uh, and quickly out of the blocks on this, the problem can be is that if the vaccines get delivered and are there in situ in the country, it's more of an issue. So it's it's kind of not sending them to to the countries uh, before it reaches that stage. So like like say Ireland has vac vaccinated all their over sixties or whatever. And then the second batch or whatever batch comes in for, for people uh, under that age group, but it's not getting them delivered to the country, it's sending them elsewhere before that. that that's the issue at play. Just want to address a few comments as well. Uh, thanks, Emma, for that one. Uh, always keep Ollie on his toes. He should have his dogs working as researchers here. Um, I've got a mosquito flying around the room here. He can be my uh, my researcher. Uh, Illyrio, I want to thank you for that comment. And gracias por mi uh, torta de cumpleaños, uh, El Domingo. Uh, I don't think Illyrio is listening right now. English wouldn't be a strong, uh, <laughs> a strong hand. And Jim, um, good man for giving up Lent. We will be addressing Lent. And not just about giving up things in a Colombian context, perhaps, but also doing good deeds, virtuous acts, which is also another element to Lent in this kind of time of reflection, even if you're not a practicing uh, Christian, Catholic, or whatever, but you can you can kind of get in on the act. So we're going to be talking about that. So if people know about charities, good causes, where can you donate, donate things if you, you have stuff you want to give away and you want to make sure it gets to those who need them most, 
uh, do send your comments that way. We'll be getting to that in about 10 minutes' time. But related to the vaccine, or semi-related, Ali, is that it could be argued, bar a few obvious areas, that Bogot is back to normal now. Well, you know, the oh, thing is... Whoa, jeez, I'm getting some some real kickback there. Um, uh, okay, so, oh, no, there we go, it's gone. Um, the thing is here, Brendan, um, cities, just like people, bounce back. And Bogota is currently bouncing back um, because cities do bounce back. And, I mean, certainly around here, a lot of businesses closed their doors. They had rental signs up for a while. And they're all coming back online uh, now. There's, I think, only one locale that hasn't reopened. All the rest um, have uh, have reopened. So, um, looking out, out at the roads, definitely not full traffic, but it's starting to return. The buses are getting more and more packed every day. People all over the park when I go out for walks with my dogs. Yeah, it does look like we're, we're on the road to recovery. I, I was certainly out on the 45 very quickly on Saturday uh, night. Absolutely, you know, every bar packed, packed to the gills. Okay, well, but I guess with the uh, maximum capacity numbers, it's not a case that they're letting all and sundry in, um, I take it. I'm going to take the fifth on that. I di we did have contributors who said the zone of tea was pretty much uh, full. People who said uh, in Usaken they had to go to a number of different places before they could find somewhere with a um, with a, a uh, um, with it with a table to sit at. So yeah, I mean, I think look as before, some places are probably taking it more seriously than others. Uh, but yeah, Bogota appears to be open for business in a limited way again. Yeah, well, Ali, I've got an observation on this because I saw a couple of comments and I've read a few comments on, on the Bogota expats and Colombian expats. And, and some people who, I guess if you're only here a few months and you're in you know, a, a, a foreign country, you're not used to the rules and you might think, oh, the police are going to come down hard on me if, if I'm kind of out when I'm not meant to be out or whatever. I uh, was reading those comments and I'm going, am I in a different city? If somebody was saying like, oh, I've been in lockdown for nine months. What? Uh, no, we've had periods in, like, periods yeah. out. And, and to be honest, I'll say something that people probably won't like here, but um, referring to that very much criticized and controversial Great Barrington Declaration and their uh, focus protection stance, in some ways, I was thinking that Bogot has kind of almost been like that since, especially since September, that a lot of people who had to go to work, and again, people say, oh, he's harking back to the barrio again, but in the barrio, it's a working class, a strato, those barrio, that most of the people were out, uh, they've been out going to work since September, their children have been out playing on the street, and I guess those who feel they need to lock themselves away, and, and although not too many can because they need to work, are doing that. But it's been kind of get about your business since then. So I would call it that kind of focused protection. And it, you know, if you comp and again, you can't compare countries because, for example, India is performing performing, if I can use that, exceptionally well in terms of debts, etc. You know, so there's a lot of factors at play, age, and all that kind of stuff comes into. But Colombia debts per thousand. Um, is not not in the, the top 10 anyway the last time i looked you know compared to countries that have had more severe lockdowns on paper anyway like the uk and uh, ireland so it, it's going to be interesting that way of course the obvious things that are missing schools still they're, they're meant to be back in business public schools i think the unions the teacher unions are, are not happy with the protocols but also ali we might as well mention protocols some of them have been to use a rugby term, and we are in Six Nations uh, season right now, have been kicked to touch. Uh, no more temperature taking in, in most of the bigger establishments, uh, nor do you have to douse your feet in, or your shoes, I should say, in, um, in, dis in disinfectant or alcohol. They, they've been deemed surplus to requirements. Indeed, Brendan, we could say you no longer have to touch down. Uh, when you try to enter a, a, a store. There, there's certainly no penalty for that anyway um yes sorry uh yeah look i think we need to applaud the uh mayor here you know we've both been relatively critical of her 
um, in the past, and I think with good reason. Um, I suspect she was acting on good faith when she uh, suggested these measures. I think shops that put them in uh, were acting in good faith as well. Um, it wasn't always mandated, not all of the measures, but there you go. Um, especially the little foot baths, for example, that was just a, a private thing, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think it takes a lot of guts for a politician to say, hey, you know what, we thought this was the right thing to do. Turns out it's not. We're changing our mind. You know, we're backtracking. You know, they always get accused of doing U-turns. And I don't think that's very helpful in that I think a lot of the time doing a U-turn just shows you're listening to people. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. So hats off to Claudia for, A, having the courage to admit, um, you know, that it maybe wasn't the right direction to go in, uh, and B, to get on with changing it. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. exactly. And to be honest, let's, um, Ali, it wasn't just Claudia Lopez. I mean, it was Claudia Lopez and oh, mayors yeah, yeah. and around the world doing these things. You know, kind of seeing. You know, um, I still have a friend, but he just does this anyway. Um, I, I make the joke that he was doing this before COVID, but when I go to visit him, he, he sprays me down in alcohol all the time. But um, <laughs> anyway, there you go, from, from head to toe. Um, uh, a, a friend there, Brendan, a friend. Yeah, well, yes, well, a colleague, actually, I could say, but anyway, more more on that to come. Oh, I did view an apartment, actually, um, this afternoon, and, and the, the owner there as well was insistent on spraying down my shoes, so she didn't get the memo from um, from, from the mayor's office to stop stop doing that. Um, we'll, we'll move away from COVID, because I know we're coming up to the half-hour mark. Uh, yeah, we are, actually, um, almost on it. Um, but... I kind of want to use the term, and you'll probably be familiar with this from Manchester back in the day when United uh, couldn't stop winning Premier League titles and what have you. They used to refer to the blue half of uh, of the city as the noisy neighbours. Uh, have we got a case of a of a noisy Maduro next door to us here annoying the, the richer Colombia in inverted commas? What, what's going on between Duque Maduro or between Colombian officialdom and, and Venezuelan officialdom? Well, good old In Maduro uh, has gone bananas again, hasn't he? He's, um, oh, I'm on form today, am I not? Um, yeah, no, he's, um, look, I mean, this is partly down to Duque. I mean, to be honest, it just, it's a sign of how toxic these two countries' relationship has become. Um, so just to fill everyone in, um, uh, Guaido from the Venezuelan um, opposition, the man who likes to call himself president, um, but doesn't have an army behind him. Juan Guaido spoke to Ivan Duque, uh, and Duque announced the possible creation of a commando force that would um, chase ALN and APL uh, rebels not only back to the border with Venezuela, but potentially into Venezuela as well, because they're hiding in Venezuela. An insinuation being that they're being helped, you know, formally by the Venezuelan government. Now, that's out of order. It's bang out of order to be saying, look, we're going to authorize our military to go into a neighbor's, um, into a neighbor's territory without formal cooperation. On the other hand, it's also bang out of order for Maduro not to cooperate. I mean, it's, imagine if 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 um, another state. Well, we have this Iran and Iraq, for example. Uh, where Iran um, obviously hides terrorists who are t who try to destabilize Iraq. I don't you know? I don't think that's necessarily the model of um, of diplomacy that we want to be following, especially not w you know, especially without the United States standing very much behind us with a big stick. Um, so yeah, just it, it seems like a stupid thing to announce from Duque, and it's a ridiculous reaction from Maduro. And frankly, I'd like to see some adults enter the diplomacy arena. Well, I guess Colombia will get their chance if you, if you think that Duque is not being the adult uh, on this occasion next year to to elect a new president. Unlikely that we're going to get a new. Uh, president in Venezuela in the next 18 months, although although uh, 24 hours is a long time in politics, so God knows what will happen with the neighbours. But yeah, a messy affair, but it does not surprise one that Nicolas Maduro isn't exactly playing ball, that's uh, for sure. Just um, a quick one, Ali, 
uh, on sport because we did mention last week because of the UK's new restriction uh, that people returning to the country, uh, no matter if you're a citizen or a resident, whatever, you'll have to do a, a 10 day quarantine and, and pay for it. Uh, that now Blue Radio was it that were reporting this week? You sent to me that uh, that, that it now looks official that there will be no James, no Mina, no Davidson, uh, Morelos with the um, with the sele selection for those qualifiers in March. Of course, every country will be affected, but you arguably Colombia will be hit the most with James and Mina, two definite starters for the games against Paraguay and Brazil. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, Davidson, Sanchez, uh, Morelos. You know, these are backup players, but they're fairly heavy backup players um yeah look it's no surprise it was from uh, gol 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 caracol by the way not from um uh not 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 from blue but um Wait, yeah, you know I mean, blue is owned by caracol you know that it's the same oh well, yes they're, they're, they're all agglomerated together yes eventually yeah. um yeah let's not start talking about the uh, the structures of me you know we're <laughs> very much one of the only only independent media's uh, media organisations out there. That virtually everyone else is agglomerated one way or another. Anyway, um, yes, look, it's hardly a surprise. I mean, if a team like uh, you know even second rank uh, Premier League teams like uh, Everton. Um, you know, they've got, or, or Tottenham, they've got really strong pull compared to the Colombian national team. I mean, if you're Hamas Rodriguez and Everton say to you, well, we're not missing you for two weeks, so, um, you know, get a massive fine or uh, and don't play for ages or suck it up. So, yeah, no surprise. Yeah, well, I yeah, see... Uh... Walter Suarez says that's pretty messed up that Colombia and Brazil will be seriously affected. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Unless uh, Colombia and Brazil then decide, although th this will bring further complications, uh, go and play the game in, in, uh, in England. But yeah, that, then that Well, but then they'd have to get, they wouldn't be able to get half their players in from other places. So, yeah, you know, it swings and roundabouts. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, well, we'll, we'll leave that there. Thanks for the comment, uh, Walter. And um, we've already had a, a few comments about our, our Lent segment now and doing or giving up things or doing good acts uh, for this season of Lent, the 40 days to represent the 40 days that our Lord Jesus Christ spent wandering the desert, drinking only water, which, see, I'm, I'm only on the water these days as well. Uh, and if you believe that, you believe anything. But it is water, by the way. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, is, it is water, but I, I'm not only drinking water. I'm kind of like Jim who sent us a message earlier on, Jim Engel, saying that he gave up Lent uh, over 40 years ago. I probably gave up giving up things for Lent, yeah, maybe about, what age, 36, so maybe 20, 21, so 16, 16 years ago. But um, the idea, it's still obviously there in the background. Um, like, if I was to give up something, um, will we start on giving up, Ollie, or will we talk about the virtuous acts? Because I know Emma's... Uh, been frantically sending us a, a whole host of different charity organisations. But will, will we get to them in, in a bit, and we'll talk about giving well, up? Let, let's just let's just address that very quickly. Let's talk about it later. But let's just quickly address. Um, if you look in the comments on the Facebook feed here, you should see from Emma Newbury, our uh, fantastic editor and owner. Um, she's posted a number of links to. Um, uh, charities that we're going to mention later. So if you do want to donate, if you do feel that you'd like to help out people who uh, aren't in a great position at the moment, um, take a look at the links. They're, they're, all, they're all in the comments. Uh, click through. They all have donation pages. But talking about giving stuff up, um, so Brendan, you know, I, uh, sorry, we've had a bit of a sort of route around with the Bogota um, post editorial team to get some ideas. Um, I suggested that some of our team want to give up uh, tacos, which didn't go down particularly well. Um, uh, there's a bit of sarcasm around uh, giving up pico y cedula. Of course, that's being lifted uh, tomorrow. And a number of people. By the way, that is definite. I haven't seen anything since. Yeah. No, no okay. possibly. I mean, it's it's really worrying that we can't get you know proper information on this sort of thing. But there you go. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, people, a number of people were saying sharing bad memes, forwarding around lazy and bad memes. That, that's a popular one from our team. Uh, jaywalking in Bogota. I don't know who. I don't know who in who thinks that's a great idea. Um, other people want to double down on efforts to jaywalk. Seems reasonable to me. Um, and what about yourself, Brendan? Anything you'd like to give up? Well, just on the jaywalking thing, like I, I think too many people live a, a, a traffic light life, and it's not always the the best um, route to success. Like I'm all all on for obeying the traffic signals when yeah. when there's clear and present danger. But if the little man is red, but there's there are no cars around for ages, and I go, well, I can kind of you know skip ahead here. There's not nothing's going to happen then I, I would just see that as, as kind of a wise move and uh, uh, prudent. To, to, so that's why I say this traffic light uh, life where people know. Oh, no, no, look, <laughs> philosophically, I don't believe we should have traffic lights. Um, I also don't believe that um, we should be telling children to look both ways before they cross the road. They shouldn't have to. Um, I, I, find, I, I think it's a really disgusting thing about our society that we put the responsibility of avoiding danger on young children who are trying to enjoy their lives in their innocent bloom and not on the giant the, the the fully grown adult who's decided to encase themselves in steel with the power of god knows how many horses weighs a couple of tons do you know what i mean it, it seems to me that we've got uh, priorities absolutely back to front i i fully support the dutch system where you say yeah you know what on back streets you drive around at five kilometers an hour and then you don't kill children. Because weirdly, Brendan, I seem to think not killing children is kind of a good good thing to aim for in society. Yeah, well, you I mean, Is that controversial? <laughs> well, wait until you have a few children yourself, you might change that. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I'm living with a one year old kid here at the moment. Anyway, moving, moving swiftly moving on. Swiftly on. If, if you want to look back at our previous episodes, uh, Ali went on a rant. I, I forget which one it was, but it was before Christmas as well. I mean, not on a rant. I agree with you on this, but when we were talking about biking in Bogota and Colombia in general as well. So, and uh, also about uh, public space. Yeah, yeah and you will, I'm sure if you search Ali and, and bikes, there's uh, an article in the Bogota Post. So, so it's all been said, unfortunately. We'll be waiting a long time before things change. The car is king, Ali, and it will be... For the next while, it seems. Um, but talking about things I should give up, well, well, like the obvious one, really, although I'm kind of torn here. Uh, uh, are my pan, pan de, de chicharron, pan is de chicharron, or pork scratching bread? Um, because it's part of my daily routine now that I go to my panaderia, which is uh, my office, um, and have my, my perico, my black, well, coffee with a dash of milk. Uh, and and these pork scratching breads, which which I uh, bread which I love. Now, why it's kind of people say, oh, with bread anyway, you should be cutting down on that yeast bread. But pork scratchings, would you believe, Ollie? Um, were in were the only meat in the top ten of this article the BBC published back in two thousand and seventeen of a list of one hundred foods that if you imagine this one superfood that doesn't exist, but if you imagined it did, hypothetical scenario, that contained all the vitamins and minerals that we needed in one bite size, um, what would it be? And I think it was almonds that topped the list, but the only meat in the in the in the top one hundred, I think, or uh, well certainly anyway, was pork scratchings which came in the top ten. Like fish was was there in the list, so so that's why I'm kind of saying I'm torn, but I'm pretty sure yeah, all that doughy bread is not good for me. But I can't I can't avoid them. It's my little outlet every every day. Well, yeah, um, but it's not about being good or not, is it? Is it meant to be about sort of things you enjoy? If I um, if I understand correctly, like getting up things that. Well, yeah, but I mean, also, if it's something you enjoy that's good for you, well, you, know, you wouldn't stop running maybe 5K every day because, oh, well, I enjoy doing that, but I'd stop doing it because that's good oh, for no, you. I thought, that was, I, th I thought that was exactly the point. I, th I thought it was about, like, I mean, for example, I enjoy walking my dogs. I can't give up walking my dogs because, you know, that's not fair on the dogs. Um, but, 
Yeah, no, I thought the idea was, okay, so I was thinking about this. I'm new to this whole Lent thing, you know, guide me, please, Padre. Um, it's the, um, uh, in fact, actually, we should sort of, um, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, one of the Father Ted actresses died, uh, I think, today or yesterday. Uh, a bit sad. Um, anyway, Mrs. O'Leary, Mrs. O'Leary? Mrs. Mrs. Doyle? Oh. No, no, the, the couple that's always arguing. Oh, the couple that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> so I, I've decided to give up. Um, I've decided to give up. I think uh, biscuits. So you know, I don't always have biscuits, but I usually have them in the house, and I'm very much prone to overeating them. And I do very much enjoy dipping a biscuit into my tea or into my coffee. Uh, I kind of often lie to myself and tell myself, oh, it's important fuel before a bicycle ride or a, or a run. But I think if I'm being honest, it's just me being a comilon. Um, so yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to say no to biscuits, you know, very much part of my daily routine in a way. Um, something I, I'm not looking forward to giving up. It gives me a lot of pleasure and joy, but I, I think that's the idea of it, isn't it? Oh no, it is definitely. Uh, it's why I think I, I carefully put in the in the script that that I didn't get to read out all of it at the start. We could talk hypothetically here because obviously uh, I'm not saying everybody has to do this. It's more just what might you give up if you were inclined to do so. And yes, it's true. Like I, I make all these excuses, but the pan chicharron is part of my routine. Routine when I go for my coffee and there in the office. I get a lot of inspiration. Like I'm not very good at just rolling out of bed and staying in the same house doing work, especially when it's a house that's not really a home, if you know what I mean. Um, so, and indeed there was an article again in the BBC a couple of weeks ago um, in their futures page or whatever, but to our work life page talking about why cafes can actually be great for creativity. And, and there were all these uh, different uh studies done on it and, and why why it is um but uh yeah so i could easily kind of go okay well i'll go for my coffee minus the bread problem is i'm friendly uh, with the panaderia owners it's a family affair and they they, they almost like when, when i go oh no i don't want any more today and they're going oh go on you'll have another two there brendan so they kind of force them on me so i need great willpower it might mean for me to give up these i'd have to go to another cafe which then then I'd be getting calls like, oh, well, just to finish it. Well, I'm just going to say, like a few months ago, this I stopped going for a few days for different reasons, and the owner called me. He was like, "Hey, are you okay? What's happened? Like, where are you? How come you haven't been in the panaderia for the last few days?" So I have to deal with that. I mean, which was nice that they that they think about me. It's not like I would, I'm I would say this much, Brendan. The the concept of Lent will not be a difficult one for most Colombians. If you just say, I'm not doing it for Lent, I'm sure they'll understand. Um well I this is what I don't know. Uh, do they actually like I know in Ireland it's it's still there, even though a lot of people now are are gonna <laughs> lax Catholic. Oh, look, they might they might think you're a bit weird, but I think they'll get the idea. It's not like you're trying to explain it to, I don't yeah. know, somebody in rural China. Yeah, no, it's 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 a very good point. It's a very good point because I mean, probably a more obvious one will be to cut back or say, no, I'm not drinking beer for forty days. But again, it's it's a balance because socializing is good for for the mind and the brain and where do you know, i socialize in the i know people go well, go and have a, a water you know you don't need to drink beer no, but yeah, then like... that becomes yeah slightly more so again it might, it might require me to not go into the barrio that, that i socialize in because there will be the peer pressure from from my friends Elirio, as i said wrote a message there earlier well he didn't he just <laughs> posted a blank <laughs> comment but um you know i'll be getting these messages hey corrigan where are you um yeah and, and then i'll just have to find alternative things which, which of course won't be good so i know people are going to say brendan you're just making a load of excuses here not to commit to this <laughs> so, well it is a question for you again brendan you know as as a lapsed catholic and you know, me not being a Catholic at all, uh, or even a Christian for that matter, or even religious. Um, am I allowed to count things like, so here's, here's a 
quandary for you. I'm trying to be vegetarian, and I'm pretty good at succeeding. I certainly don't eat meat in the house. I occasionally eat it when I'm outside. Am I allowed to give up meat for Lent, given that I've kind of given up meat for the last 18 months, really? Does that count as a giving up? It's more of a continuation. Does that count as a Lent sacrifice? Well, I love the way you're asking me as if I am the uh, the expert on this, but of course I am the only Catholic in the room here in inverted commas right now. Um, well, I, I, look, it, it, there, there are no rules in this, of course. It, it, it just it depends, I guess, that you feel you're making maybe some sort of a sacrifice. That's the whole point behind it, is that you're kind well, of... Well, I mean, that, that's actually the, the, the thing. I mean, I mean, I don't... The reason I don't eat meat is not... Because I don't like meat, it's because I, you know, I, I very much do like meat. I enjoy eating meat, um, but I also think that, you know, there's a lot of moral cost that comes along with it, and I'd prefer to perpetuate less of that if I can in the future. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and like, just there are a number of things at play there. Then it's not just a sacrifice. It's it's what you feel you should be doing for the future of of. The planet, humanity, whatever. Um, yeah, that it's a good deed to do all round, and not just for for the forty days of Lent. And and to be to be honest, a lot of people, you know, who've given up smoking, like that's why Ash Wednesday is national, or I think global no smoking day, I should say. Uh, that it's um, a lot of people who've given up smoking, especially in Ireland that I know of, they started during Lent, you know, and they really pushed themselves in those forty days and, and got over all the cravings, and then it's like, okay, I'm not going back. So it can be the springboard to, to new things. But, of course, the other element to this, I don't know if we want to keep on the giving up side, because the other element then, and going back to, to Emma with the links to charities, is it's not giving up, per se. It doesn't, doesn't have to be that you give up, but it's that you do something else. Like, you know, it, it could be just something personal. Okay, I'm going to push myself, train, take up a sport or something that's going to be good for my health, or... or you try and help out other people that you 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 contribute more um to to society or whatever that that's the other element of it it doesn't have to be just saying no more of a certain thing but we actually help uh society at large so that's where so, so let's yeah. let's talk about some of these charities then yeah absolutely um because people do um you know, people do want, I think, to, to, to contribute and to help out. Um, and let's just um, let's, let's throw a few names out there. And by the way, anybody who's listening outside, if you've got any recommendations, if you've got any anybody that you know who is doing uh, good work, please do let us know. And there are even more charities in various Bogota Post uh, articles going back quite a long time, especially articles on... Um, Venezuelan migrants and on Providencia we had some specific ones but the one I'd like to start off talking about because um, I think it's quite personal uh, certainly for us at the Bogota Post um, but also for people for, for quite a lot of people I think in Colombia especially in the international community here uh, which is a man called Sam Ling uh, Gibson um, uh, and his family have set up um, after his untimely death, um, uh, a trust to con to continue a lot of the work that actually he did uh, in his life. Uh, we're talking about a rather wonderful um, young man who died a year and a half ago, um, and his his time in Colombia, I think, was exemplary uh, compared to many foreigners, in that he did a hell of a lot of charity work. He was very involved in helping, uh, especially young people in conflict zones. He took the time out um, to study uh, conflict and, and conflict situations and resolution with the idea of helping out further in the future. Uh, he was an inspiration to many of his students. He was involved in the local graffiti scene. And he, you know, he's just a man that touched a lot of people. So um, that's a really great charity to um, uh, to, to to start off and, and to uh, to look at. Uh, again, that's that's in the um, that's in the comments. Uh, Sam Ling Gibson Trust dot uh, dot org. Um, that's one to consider. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, great, like an inspiration. I, I talked about like uh, giving back to, to society or whatever, uh, that that's what you can do for that. And, and he was the prime example of that, Sam. Um, I only met him on a couple of occasions, but yeah, real positivity in what he did. And, and I spoke to his good friend, um, Harry Tittenzer, in, in a podcast interview last year as well. So you can get a, a, an essence of, of how Sam was and the work he did. And the tireless work that he did as well. You know, you we, we've often bashed these influencers that come here and oh look at me. But you know, he just went about his work very quietly. Um, yeah, a great a great foundation and charity to get involved uh, with. Another one, by the way, down that side of the city as well in Suidad Bolivar, uh, an Australian guy, Sammy Riley, co-founded this. It's called Ruta the Esperanza, and it, again, it's, a, it's got local people from the community since the. Um, the cable car goes up into Suidad, Bolivar, and, and areas around there to take people on tours. So it's bringing tourists there. It's still, obviously, they've been affected as well with the pandemic with tourist numbers down and stuff like that, but it's still available. So even if you've been here, like I've, I, I interviewed again Sammy for my Samana podcast back when I was running that, and, and I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to get on the tour. Still haven't done it, so um, that's uh, uh, a shame on me. I need to get down there and, and do it just even to go down and see that neck of the woods. But well, we're uh, yeah. Our writer Gerald Barr has um, highlighted um, the cable cars and uh, the Ruta de la Esperanza as well. And again, that's there in the comments. If you've um, if you've got access to the comments, if you can see them there. That's also a clickable link. You can go and book your tour right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, maybe, maybe not right now. Obviously. <laughs> no. Uh, well, if they do night nighttime tours down in Surrey, that Bolivar, that might be uh, interesting. You know? Spicy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, any any other charities um, that you know, like in terms of even like simple ones that people have uh, closed to donate, or you know that they no longer need, or fur yeah, furniture. People maybe want to get rid of furniture or things like that. Or do we know of charities that are not? Yes, there's a there's a couple from uh, the Providencia um, Alert. They're fairly easy to find on social media. I believe we had links to them in our uh, Providencia Hurricane story uh, that we did relatively recently. Let me see if I can find that later. Um, certainly, if you're looking for a great Latin American charity, not just in Colombia, but if you're listening from overseas, uh, Techo. Uh, which is Spanish for roof or ceiling. Um, uh, absolutely fantastic, um, absolutely fantastic work that Techo do uh, all around Latin America, especially at the moment in uh, both San Andres and Providencia after the the devastating hurricane uh, at the end of last year. So that that's a great shout. Um, also, Emma's given us a link to Niñas Sin Miedo. Uh, .org. That's a really nice uh, charity that aims to get uh, girls cycling. So there's a lot of barriers, you know, obviously it's quite close to my heart. Um, there's a lot of barriers towards women uh, cycling and a lot of them are about safety. You know, the fear that you'll be attacked on your bike, the fear that you'll be, uh, that you'll suffer sort of sexual harassment and so forth and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so it's really good to get girls sort of cycling at a young age before they fall into this trap of thinking that it's a boy's thing and, and, and not having access to, you know, what is, you know, for all the slings and arrows posted, it, this is a pretty good cycling city. Uh, and everyone should have the opportunity to take part in it. Yeah, well, unless you have to cycle up um, El Corito or up the hills there on, on my Mary Poppins bike, that requires a lot of work. That's pretty, pretty tough. Um, but a lot of these charities as well, Ali, um, important, I guess, to know, because you do get comments from people, people asking, like, can they volunteer? I'm taking practically all of these charities will say yes, come on board, we have work for you, well, as long as you pass certain clearances and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I don't think there's any charity that won't say no to somebody willing to help out, no matter what it is, in, in some sort of a small way, be it in the office or, or getting more involved practically or whatever. I'm sure there are plen plenty of um, jobs to be done for these charities that are always struggling, because I think getting set up here as a charity as well isn't, isn't always straightforward from what I gather. You know no, what I mean? it, 
it, it's not always easy. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, I know that's not necessarily a helpful answer. Certainly, uh, I used to do a lot of charity work when I lived in London. Um, we were constantly inundated with people who would kind of say, oh, well, I can do this for you. And we'd say, yeah, that, that, that's not very useful for us. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we don't, you know, they, they, they're donating their time at, at a time when we don't need extra volunteers. They're going to go, oh, but I'm, I'm giving up my time for you. Go, yeah, well, we didn't ask you to do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just be a little bit careful in there. I mean, certainly not everybody needs people who can't speak Spanish. There's a, there's a thing straight off the bat. Um, sometimes you may be better off uh, getting involved in other ways, helping them reach out to international communities, things like that. Um, it is worth pointing out, by the way, I just did a quick test. Um, we do have a pro we had a Providence here. If you search for Bogota Post uh, Hurricane Iota, uh, scroll to the end of that article. Uh, there's a link there for Techo again, Solidaridad. Poor Colombia, which I think is still working, and Red Feed Providence, uh, where you can donate money, equipment, food, clothes, or time. I did offer them some uh, furniture at the end of last year, but they, they don't really want furniture. It's a bit too big to post over. But clothes are in good condition. Uh, children's toys, that's a big one. Uh, things like that. Building materials, definitely very, very much appreciated. Okay, good. We've got two minutes, less than two minutes left, Ollie. I just want to finish on, on something really quickly. Um, you know, if you're in the UK or whatever and somebody comes up to you and goes, will you buy a, a raffle ticket? I, I'm guessing your first, your first reply or response would be is their question is, oh, well, what's it for? And you would expect it to be for some cause. It's, you know, for my cousin who's got leukemia or it's for the local football club so that they can build uh, um, dressing rooms, etc. Uh, here in uh, in Bogota, Colombia, in general, you, you'll often get un inundated with these little things by <laughs> by the little um, raffle ticket. What's it for? Well, my good old friend Fernando down in La Perseverancia regularly sells these. And when I ask, what's it for? Well, just to make money, <laughs> to make it a, an additional income. I have to say, this one that I bought, in fairness, did go to a good cause. It was from a Venezuelan mother and it's for the uniform for her well so i was told anyway the uniform for her um for her daughter to, to go to school but yeah I, I kind of find it funny that they have these um these raffles here and a lot of the time it's just somebody wants to make an extra bit of money so they'll come up they'll buy you can buy these these raffle tickets uh two thousand pesos for a book of uh, 100 tickets uh and then you can come up with the price usually you know between three thousand or five thousand and whatever prize you have, you raffle it, and there you go. It's a way of making some extra money. Yeah, that, that's a bit cheeky, I think. Yeah. Um, it often happens in my university that the uh, students want to raise money for, for university projects. That I don't have a problem with. University projects to take place in the nearest bar. I, I'm familiar with those. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, think, yeah. I think we're at time. <laughs> We are indeed. Uh, yeah, apologies for the start there, but as I said, uh, emerging market internet problems here in the north of Bogota. But uh, at least we, we, we finished well, which is always a good sign. Uh, going over in the corner for that last minute try to keep up with the, with the rugby uh, talk. Ali, until next week. Good night. Good night.